Hi, my name is Eva Rovers and I'm studying ways in which we can save the climate and our democracies because it is code red for humanity. We need ambitious, drastic climate policies if we want to keep our planet habitable. Over the last few years or decades even, representative democracy is failing. It's failing the social contract, a contract between citizens and politicians politicians. A contract that basically says citizens hand over their political power to politicians and in return, at the very least, they are protected by the state from danger. Or to put it in the words of the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes, political legitimacy depends on whether it can protect those who have consented to obey it. But that protection has ceased. The dangers of climate change have been well known for decades, but governments are not protecting their citizens against it. Already in 1957, scientific evidence was presented of global warming and that it was caused by humans. And politicians knew. In 1965, the American President Johnson said, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale. There have been many books on the topic. Uh, for instance, the groundbreaking work, The Limits to Growth by the Club of Rome, that basically said, if people keep producing and consuming as they do, they will pretty much destroy the earth they live on. And from 1988 onwards, the United Nations have commissioned the International Panel on Climate Change to research and analyze climate change and its impact. So if all this knowledge has been out there for so long, why haven't governments protected their citizens? Well, for one reason, elections. Elections make politicians focus on the short term, it makes them focus on promises they can perhaps keep in the next four to five years to save themselves for the next re-election. Another major factor is the fossil industry who has poured millions and millions of dollars into lobbying and disinformation to disinform people, make them doubt climate change and climate science. And a lot of governments are not representative. They are not actually representative of their society. And to know what is going on in society, to get a sense of what people want or feel or aspire, they have polls or they use social media, but those are not very good indications of people's informed opinion. And what makes it even more difficult is that a lot of people don't have much trust in government or in political institutions. Only one in five people feel that the political system is actually working for them. And this is all very worrying, of course, but it's even more problematic in the face of climate change. For instance, this summer of 2021, we saw an increase of extreme weather events, varying from wildfires and floods and drought. And also that we saw a rapid, rapidly increasing climate injustice which means that countries that have hardly contributed to climate change are suffering the most from it. And in August, the International Panel on Climate Change published its report, and it said that it's code red for humanity. Unless there are immediate, rapid and large-scale reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, we will be unable to limit global warming. So, how do we realize these drastic reductions if even the modest measures are already causing so much unrest? For instance, the Yellow Vest movement in France or the fierce resistance against wind farms in many, many countries. Do we perhaps need enlightened despotism or perhaps a green autocracy? Or do we have to leave everything over to techno uh, technology and, ha and start a technocracy? No. We do not need less democracy, we need more, far more democracy. Or to put it in the words of Hannah Arendt, a state in which there is no communication between the citizens and where each man thinks only his own thoughts is by definition a tyranny. So we need to start communicating with each other, 
citizens need to communicate, talk to each other about how we can transition into this just and sustainable future. But how do we do that? How do we turn polarization and atomization into communication? How do we mitigate both climate change and the weakening of democracies? How do, to develop climate policy that is democratic, impartial and effective? And how to make sure that climate, climate policy affects people equally? Well, by organizing climate citizens assemblies. A climate citizens assembly is a group of randomly selected citizens who learn about climate change, who deliberate possible solutions and to, who conclude to formulate recommendations that they can give to their government. And to organize a climate citizens assembly, uh, you need three phases. And the first phase is preparation. It's very important that the whole process is facilitated by an independent organization. So not a government itself, but an independent organization. Also very important that there is enough time allocated to the citizens' assembly. So not just two weekends, rather more six or seven weekends. Also uh, very important that there is a proper question, not an easy yes or no question, but a proper open question. Um, and that there is a very clear mandate so that the people in the citizens' assembly, but also wider society, knows what will be done with the recommendations, what will be the political follow-up. And to select the people, the 100 or 150 people that are taking part in the climate assembly, to select those people you use random sampling or a civic lottery, which means that everybody has equal chance to take part and that the citizens' assembly is a reflection of society, so that everyone in society, even though you are not part of the citizens' assembly, can think, well, someone like me is taking part in this assembly. And also very important that there is a public campaign even before the start, so that everybody in, in a country or, or in a municipality knows there will be a climate citizens' assembly and it will be about this topic, and. Uh, there are ways to participate or to learn together with the people in the assembly. And then there's the citizens' assembly itself. And this process also consists of three phases. There's the learning phase where people um, learn about climate change. They get science-based information, but very comprehensible. They learn that there's a difference between incremental change and systemic change, that there is a difference between adapting to climate change and uh, mitigating climate change. And they have the liberty to ask for experts themselves, to ask for information that they miss or that they, that they that, that need. So there's a balanced, uh, there's a lot of information and people can ask for what they need. Um, and then they start deliberating in smaller groups. So, and this is not meant for people to convince other participants of their opinion. It's really about deliberating, about sharing uh, their perspectives and to see if there's common ground. And when they found that common ground, from there they will start to uh, formulate recommendations. And these recommendations are then written into a report which is uh, given to, the, uh, to their government. And of course, and this is very critical, you want those recommendations to be implemented. You want political follow-up. And to guarantee that there are various ways, for instance, there needs to be an independent monitoring committee that really keeps track of all the steps uh, the government is taking to implement those recommendations. And to do that, it's also important that there is a media campaign so that politicians feel even more obliged to really keep the promises they made beforehand and respect the mandate. And of course, climate citizens' assemblies shouldn't be a one-off thing. To make sure that they receive political follow-up, it's important that they become as common as elections, even more common than elections. Does this all sound too good to be true, or perhaps too difficult to be true? Well, actually, climate citizens' assemblies are already taking place. National assemblies have taken place in France, in the UK, in Germany, in Denmark, Ireland, Scotland, and in many, many cities all over the world. And currently, there is even a global assembly, bringing together peoples from 
all over the world. Despite time zones and languages and cultures, these people are talking about how, as citizens of the world, uh, we can move towards a just and sustainable future. And they will present their recommendations to world leaders at COP26. None of these climate assemblies are perfect. There's still a lot to be learned, especially when it comes to safeguarding political follow-up. But they do indicate that climate citizens' assemblies are a just and effective way to revive our democracies and the life support system we call Earth. <laughs>